Welcome to the New Chemist podcast. We're glad you're listening. Feel free to download this podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Here on the New Chemist, we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as the other sciences, careers, community research, and COVID-19. Okay, Dr. Joe Hansen, it is so good to have you on the podcast today. Uh, welcome to the New Chemist Podcast. We're glad you're listening. Feel free to download this podcast on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Odyssey, Stitcher, and a variety of other platforms. Here on the New Chemist, we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as careers, community research, COVID-19, we discuss thesis, lectures, and we discuss people's careers in detail. So, we're happy you're tuning in. My guest today is Matthias Johansson. Thanks for joining me today. It is so good to hear from you. Just briefly, I'll inform my audience about you. So, Matthias is actually a colleague of mine. We taught at the same university. Uh, during my first time teaching, um, I got the opportunity to meet Matthias um, at the University of Bahamas. But Matthias is currently the assistant professor for small island sustainability at the University of the Bahamas, a field station coordinator um, with the University of Bahamas. He has served in roles such as um, an assistant professor with the biology department at the University of North Georgia in Gainesville. He has served as a research associate. Uh, and he also has his PhD in fishery sciences with a specialty in genetics from Oregon State University, um, a master of science in biology, a bachelor of science in biology with marine emphasis. So Matthias is a very established, a very accomplished colleague of mine. So it's a pleasure to have him on the podcast today. So thank, thank you. you for having me, David. I'm yeah. fun to be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, Matthias, as we get started, what have been your long-standing interests in the field of science? Well, my interests have really shifted kind of as I've learned more about the field, but the kind of through line that runs through it is genetics. I've been interested in genetics for a really long time. But, uh, you know, when I was in high school and realized I wanted to do biology, I probably didn't really know what genetics was, but I discovered it as a real interest and as a love in college at uh, Western Washington University. And I actually, my first kind of job in genetics, I don't remember if I was paid or if I was volunteer, to be honest, but I actually tutored other students in genetics uh, at the invitation of my genetics um, professor. And since then, it's kind of been the thing that I've done in every kind of research role that I've had. Mostly it's been population genetics, which is kind of where we use genetic information uh, extracted from individuals to understand the movement of populations or the connectivity between populations. But I've also done bits of stuff with genomics and identifying uh, microbes and things like that. So a little bit of various. The nice thing about doing genetic work is that it doesn't really matter what the organism is. Once you get them back to the lab, they basically, you extract DNA from a little tissue sample and the work from that point forward is more or less the same. So it's a very versatile set of tools as well, which is part of what excites me about it. Oh, wow, that's good, that's good. So, you know, for, for what I've seen so far in terms of genetics, it seems like genomics is like a hot hot topic, genomics, lipidomics, all those things, especially genomics. So what what's your take on the introduction of genomic ideas or genomic concepts to undergrads. What's your take on that? How useful do you think that is? Or a little bit too detailed for them? What do you think? No, I think it's really useful for students to know kind of that science is a developing field. Uh -huh. You know, we should be pointing out to students where the cutting edge is and, and giving them the opportunity to, to kind of work there as much as we can in, um, in you know the undergrad situation mm -hmm. genomics is a beautiful uh you know it's a beautiful tool for teaching undergraduates in that 
there are lots and lots of genomic resources. There's lots of genetic information available online for nothing. Mm -hmm. um, it's generally a requirement of publication that you uh, make your data available publicly. Mm -hmm. And so anybody can go to, for example, the NCBI webpage and just find data on their organism of interest. And then we can use the tools many of the tools that are developed for doing genomic analysis or genetic analysis generally are developed by other researchers uh -huh. to solve a problem and if i build a tool to solve a problem that i have you know why not make it available in general in science nobody's out to make any money so that's why we're scientists and not business people uh -huh. so people make the tools available online again for nothing or very nominal costs so those are things we can have students download and we can do very powerful genetic analyses with basically free resources mm -hmm. and you know we can take students almost right out to the edge of at least the data analysis the lab piece is a little trickier because resources uh, you know lab equipment is very expensive and lab consumables cost money as well they tend not to be very cheap either so it's hard to do a lot you know in the lab with classes um, although you know many universities do introduce their students to, uh, to very uh, advanced genetic techniques in, in basic biology courses mm -hmm. so that's something we're working up to at the university of the bahamas right now at least ub north we don't have those resources available to us just yet yeah yeah i agree i agree so how do you maintain view of the bigger picture in your career and in your life in general so how do you keep perspective how do you stay optimistic how do you stay hopeful when you face like challenges in your work or challenges in your personal life what perspective allows you to maintain view of a big picture i mean i tend to i guess i feel like i'm very lucky i've been very lucky to this point and i guess i don't expect that to change somehow mm -hmm. Um, but I certainly, um, I don't know if I have a sort of overarching vision. I have kind of a philosophy of how I approach my job. Um, okay. and it's very service focused. You know, I want to do the best I can when I prep a course, when I write a reference letter for a student, when I write a paper, you know, I want it to be the best it can possibly be. And that kind of that is the through line i would say that kind of goes you know carries my my professional life forward okay and there are certainly certainly challenges um you know it's it, there are always difficulties and there are always things that uh, uh you know kind of knock you off course but mm -hmm. the reality is i've tended always to land on my feet or i feel like i've always landed on my feet i i uh, graduated with my PhD kind of right into the tail end of the 2008 economic disaster mm -hmm. you know, and that that meant that jobs were were hard to come by so I ended up being a postdoc for much longer than I would have preferred um, but I had really interesting opportunities and you know learned a lot through that path and I eventually found you know I found a job that I enjoyed very much and then I found a job that you know offered a bit more in terms of being you know in the environment and, and actually being a marine scientist here at the university of the bahamas mm -hmm. and as part of that job i've also sort of discovered additional opportunities there's 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 lots of opportunity because there's lots of need you know mm -hmm. especially the university uh you know the north campus ub north mm -hmm. was destroyed by hurricane dorian Mm -hmm. And, you know, the uh, as a result, we've got challenges, which means we have opportunities. And of course, you know, coming through the pandemic, we've all sort of dealt with those challenges. But you can kind of turn that on its side, look at it a particular way, and you can see that, you know, we can be teaching students very far away. We can be doing really cool stuff with virtual learning. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. replace certainly it doesn't replace the field you know like the important parts of being in the field but also we've had the opportunity to develop partnerships with um, 
various other agencies, both here in the Bahamas and outside the Bahamas, mm-hmm. that I think are going to lead to some really cool stuff. So I generally just tend to be uh, really optimistic, and that tends to carry me along. Good, good, good. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, it's good to be optimistic or hopefully realistic. It's very good. So what have been what have been your most uh, creative or insightful ideas so far in the field of science? What ideas have you done either in your research career or as serving as faculty has really been a source of inspiration to your students or has been a really creative idea or an adaptive idea that you've implemented um, during your career as a scientist? What would you what would you say? Would it be a research project? Would it be a dissertation? Would it be your um, work that you're doing now? What would you say has been really a, a hallmark of your creativity or your ability to adapt in science? I mean, that's a challenging question, but I think kind of the... I mean, I guess for me, the challenge of going through the pandemic and kind of realizing that I could still be of service to my student, that I could still um, kind of, I could still deliver a a quality educational experience. Uh, Certainly, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, when I was at the University of North Georgia at the time, and I can still remember vividly, it's like, I can't remember anything during lockdown vividly because none of us can, but I can remember vividly right before lockdown, we were about to go into spring break that March of 2020 or whatever it was. And Mm -hmm. we were talking about how this, you know, this thing is, is overblown. It was Georgia, of course, and uh, we probably didn't have the greatest wisdom about the whole situation, global picture. But we were basically, the plan was we were going to go into, uh, we were going to take an extra week of spring break. So spring break was going to be two weeks. That would give us time to adapt. And then we would be right back. And then two years later, you know, we kind of find ourselves back in some form. And I, you know, I spent the first week of that spring break essentially just mourning the loss of the job that I adored because what I really enjoy is that interaction with students but you know that second week I just got down to business and figured out okay I gotta have some kind of product to deliver and and it was a real it felt like a real trial by fire you know getting forced into this situation that nobody really wanted I mean certainly it was incredibly disruptive for all of us mm-hmm but I felt like it went pretty well. And, and the students, the feedback that I got was, was generally quite positive. And I've kind of realized that that's a set of tools that I can continue to use. And that opens up, you know, these huge vistas of opportunity in terms of we could be teaching. The University of the Bahamas has three physical locations. One of them we really don't use for teaching. That's the Gerace Research Center. The two places we use for for teaching are on two islands of 700 islands and keys. So, you know, for for many of the family islands, it is pandemic conditions all the time. They can't be in a classroom because there isn't a classroom, but we could be using these tools and delivering educational experiences, uh, you know, excellent educational experiences to students throughout the Bahamas or throughout the Western Caribbean, throughout the, uh, or the uh, Western Atlantic rather, throughout the Caribbean. You know, we, we need to be sort of recognizing the opportunity in these challenges. And that's something that really for me came out of the pandemic. Hmm. Oh, it's interesting that you, you, you consistently bring up the theme of basically capitalizing on the challenges or seeing the unmet needs as opportunities. Yeah, it's interesting you keep on bringing it up. So you find that, do you think that, uh, I know that's easier said than done, but do you think that is something you've really done well during your time at UB? Would you say that's something you've done well so far? Or I mean, done- I think it... I think it is. I think it is something. It's certainly, um, I wouldn't say that the job is done by any yeah, means. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're but doing well. It is certainly something I take pride in working toward and okay, in, okay. In kind of campaigning for. Okay. Um, I mean, I, 
as I said at the beginning, I tend to be pretty optimistic. Mm -hmm. I think part of that is not getting ground down by frustrations and challenges because the reality is life is full of frustration. Life is full of challenges. You know, I, uh, you know, you, any, any life is going to be full of setbacks. That's just how life works. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, rarely do we have a perfectly linear path to, to greatness and, and no one ever puts a stumbling block in our way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being, essentially being forgiving or being willing to forget the challenges is part of that i think but also recognizing that okay this challenge actually has a solution or might have a solution and we should explore that i think that's really important as well you know seeing that that we do have agency in this world and and it's important to to move things in a better direction as much as we can i agree i agree so I think that's really my my philosophical kind of perspective on life. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So, um, how have you sought or found the right environment for you to thrive scientifically and intellectually? So, what process did you go through as you went through um, finding your spot in graduate school, finding your spot specifically for this question, finding your spot at University of North Georgia and then the Bahamas? What process or list or framework do you go through when you're trying to find a job? Or find a place for you well, to thrive scientifically and intellectually, however you want to phrase it. The thing I find interesting about this question is this is uh, when I communicate with students, Uh huh. this is one of those things I really try to communicate that I don't think they can absorb very well. Okay. Because students have this perspective that we essentially as you know professionals in our field whether we're scientists or whether we're doctors or whatever it is Mm. we basically woke up one morning with a plan and then we point by point went through the plan and arrived today in wherever we are oh man that's funny that's funny that's funny yeah my experience my experience has absolutely been a random walk you know i have brown emotion yeah so (laughs) i got out of I, I knew that it, when I was in college, I knew that I wanted to go to graduate school, but I, I didn't have the wherewithal to, to talk to my advisor about how that actually worked. So I kind of fell, fell out one end of college with a diploma in hand and no clue. So I basically, I worked at a dive shop for a while. I worked at Sears and I kind of puzzled it out and I emailed uh, perspective uh, advisors. I wanted to be a shark ecologist because everybody wants to be a shark ecologist or a dolphin one who was interested in marine science at least. Mm. Um, and I actually sent an email to a guy who was then at the Moss Landing Marine Lab, um, Dr. Greg Kaye. And he told me he had 19 graduate students already. So he wasn't looking for any more. But he gave me a name. He mm-hmm. said, have you contacted Ralph Larson at San Francisco State? And I had never heard of Ralph Larson at San Francisco State. And he's not a shark guy. He's now retired, but he was a very effective teacher and a very uh, productive rockfish, uh, the genus Sebastes, which is a very speciose genus of fishes on the West Coast of uh, North America. He studied them for his career. Okay. And so I became a fish guy instead. Okay. But that gave that gave me the opportunity to do genetics. I did a genetics project for my master's. So okay. I got into fish, I got into genetics. And then, you know, I had another opportunity at the University of California, Davis, okay. where the timing the timing just didn't work. So the opportunity kind of slipped out of my fingers. And okay. when I threw that, they basically said, Have you talked to Michael Banks at Oregon State? And I said, no, I've never heard of Michael Banks at Oregon State. But I sent Michael Banks an email and said, hey, I'm looking for a PhD opportunity. And he said, we should talk. I landed at Oregon State, and that was an amazing opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when I graduated there, I had, I did a little short postdoc uh, at the Hatfield Marine Science Center where I'd been based. And then I just applied for jobs that I saw online. And I ended up uh, in Milwaukee at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, working mm-hmm. in 
for a guy named Philippe Alberto doing um, genetic population genetic work on mm-hmm. uh, on giant kelp. And I learned to use R, and that was a valuable tool going forward. Uh, uh-huh. And then I ended up getting a postdoc position at the University of Windsor uh, at the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research, or CLEAR. Uh-huh. And I worked with two different guys, Hugh McIsaac and um, Dan, uh, and what's Dan's last name? I can't remember Dan's last name. That's all right. So I worked with two guys and I actually got into the field of invasive species ecology. Oh, and yeah. So I've kind of combined all these different things as I've gone along. And so now I would consider myself an invasive species ecologist as well as a population geneticist. Mm-hmm. And then when I was looking all the while as I'm doing postdocs, I'm applying for jobs for faculty positions. Mm-hmm. And you know, the offer that came through was from the University of North Georgia. And then uh, that was a great position and I, I really liked it, but it was principally teaching and it was it was a marine biology faculty position, but it's four or five hours from the ocean. Um, so, you know, I saw an ad for a job at the University of the Bahamas that seemed like uh, seemed like an exciting possibility. It was one of those like, what if this happened? That'd be kind of funny. And then it did happen and you have yeah. to puzzle out them. <laughs> you have to figure out some logistics to move. Yeah. So, and that's uh, that's been a challenge uh, for my family. My my wife is now in Washington State, and uh, it's not really ideal. So, yeah. But you know, it really has been just kind of happenstance, and it's been making connections, making individual personal connections with people, and yeah. it really the plan was to become a college professor. Like way back, the plan was that, but the path to getting there has been anything but linear and it's you know it's been as much uh chance as it has been my own powerful decision making uh-huh. abilities uh-huh i feel like you do you said a lot of things a lot of things which are very good and see the thing is i don't think the path is linear but i think the combination in a sense may be linear you just have different weights on different experiences or different features like in mo theory we talk about linear combinations but anyway i leave that right there also for r i think yeah r is very useful because you know and there's also a program you could you you could use if you're trying to learn r called swirl um as well as you talk about UC Davis, it's interesting to bring up UC Davis. One of my mentors is actually in administration at UC Davis. You know, uh, Chancellor May. He's he's a very good mentor of mine. So, yeah, it's definitely very interesting stuff. And the thing that stands out to me as like a key feature in your story is strategically emailing people and not being afraid to email. I think sometimes we miss out on opportunities because we just don't take the shot. We just don't send the email. Send it well, craft it well. Let someone else read over it. But try, you know, there's nothing wrong with trying. And I've had that experience in which I've been able to meet new professors or get interviews or schedule job interviews or just develop my professional acumen and network through just emails, having the opportunity yeah. to email and then meet people. So I think that's very, very important. I'm glad you shared that story. So um, how do you uh, maintain vision and teamwork in your environment? How do you keep the collaborative spirit going? where you work and and what you do even in your classroom how do you keep that going um in the classroom it's a bigger challenge than otherwise um undergraduates are by their nature uh shy and retiring somehow i don't know they're young enough that they still care what other people think i think arriving in my mid-40s has been the principal blessing of getting older is that you lose interest in what other people think yeah because my students are so they just don't want to put their head above the parapet i uh i require students to work together of course Um, (laughs) that's the main piece of leverage that we have as faculty members um but in my field you know uh, or in my job i just i reach out to colleagues and um you know i make sure that people know what i'm up to and what i'm Mm -hmm. interested in Mm -hmm. um but another powerful tool is i basically don't say no to things i don't say no when people ask me to help with something okay and that opens up opportunities too I mean, it does mean that your schedule gets busy, but Mm -hmm. a lot of requests are straightforward and and very simple things that can potentially lead to other stuff. So, 
you know, I, I basically try to make myself available because I think, you know, building that, those connections, building that network is, you know, partly kind of that collegiality piece of what we do professionally. Uh-huh. But it also is likely to lead to opportunities and ultimately to opportunities for our students. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's good. That's good. So, do you have any advice for those wanting to pursue the field you're currently working in, Matthias? Do you have any advice for those who want to get involved in ecology or invasive ecology or population genetics or biology in general? What advice would you give them? Um, I mean, I guess your studies are super important. Like, yeah, that's yeah. the first thing. Um, you know, making sure that. If you if you want to be successful in the field, you have to give it the time that it deserves. And a lot of our students, unfortunately, work. They you know they have to contribute at home, or maybe they live on their own, or whatever. But that definitely makes it much more challenging. So hopefully, being able to focus uh, helps. But making personal connections is another super important thing that I don't think uh, students. Uh, the average student, I'll say, necessarily recognizes the importance of. So, you know, a lot of students think if I just do my classes and I get decent grades, then opportunities are going to open up. But it is, it's just easier for people to hire somebody they know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, taking those outside opportunities, doing internships or volunteering, we have, uh, we're very lucky here in Grand Bahama to have lots of opportunities for our students and kind of more in the pipeline. The challenge that I run into is that the students don't see the value. In it. They don't recognize that, you know, by doing that internship at Company X, mm-hmm. Company X is going to know who they are. Yeah. Gonna, if they have a permanent position, the, the student's resume will say Company X on it. And it'll be easier to justify if they've done a good job, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easier to justify hiring mm-hmm. and, you know, getting more diverse. I, I write lots of reference letters for students. And some students, I can basically say the student was in my class and got a decent grade. But the CV or the transcript, you know, the university provides says exactly the same thing. It just doesn't have my signature at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. So by, by having a, a reference letter that says, you know, the student worked for our nonprofit marine science organization for a summer, did a fantastic job and did this task and this task and that task, and they were great with the kids and they were doing whatever. That sounds a lot better than mm-hmm. the student took my ecology class and got an A minus. Because who cares? Like, you know, students get decent grades. Mm-hmm. The students who are being considered for jobs are going to have a reasonable GPA. So mm-hmm. that isn't something you need a reference letter about. What you want reference letters to do is to say, you know, a little bit more about you. And the way to get that is to take these opportunities as they're presented. I agree. That's That's been a challenge with my uh, beloved students, unfortunately. Yeah, I hear you, and I hope I wish you all the best for that challenge. But I would say, yeah, classwork is almost like a local currency, and the experience allows you to basically convert that currency so that it's valuable to other people. So, what has been some of the most beneficial advice you have received? If you had to think back from either parents, professors, your spouse, um, what would be some of the most beneficial advice you have personally received in your career or in your life in general? Well, I would say that. Um... The, it, I wouldn't even describe it as advice. It was just sort of my PhD advisor kind of telling me about myself. Okay. Because my, uh, my interest is very strong in teaching. Um, and I enjoy research, but it uh, doesn't give me the satisfaction that teaching does. And that really... At a lot of universities, that doesn't line up very well with the job of a professor. So at a lot of universities, you know, these heavily research intensive universities, Mm -hmm. the job of a professor is to do research and secondarily to teach. But what I found is that 
I need to be at a university where teaching is the primary focus because that's where I get my energy from my job. That's what I love about the job. Okay. And that, that really was something that my PhD advisor, Michael Banks, pointed out to me, you know, that you clearly love teaching and here, you know, this is the kind of job, you're in the kind of job you should have. So, you know, that was really valuable to me. And I think it kind of boils down to the, you know, the adage, know thyself. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people often are kind of, they think everybody else is paying really close attention to them, I think. And I, re the reality is everybody, like we all are, everybody's navel gazing. They're just thinking about themselves. They think everyone else is thinking about them, but everyone else is thinking about themselves, just like all of us do. Mm -hmm. So you can't, you can't try to achieve your goals to satisfy others. Mm -hmm. You have to try to achieve your goals to satisfy yourself. And that really means you need to know what you want. And that can be hard to do. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I certainly encourage students to think about what their, their needs are, what their wants are, what their desires are. Um, you know, I, I talked to a student in my office several years ago who wasn't doing well in my class. And I, I had meetings with all my introductory biology students who were doing poorly in the class. And he said he wasn't interested in college. He, was, he wanted to do a trade. And I was impressed that he knew that. I was impressed that he told me that because I don't need him to stay in my class if he's not going to be happy with the path. He was in college for someone else. He was in college because his parents said, well, give it a try. But what he wanted to do didn't, that didn't follow that path. So I basically said, you know, I, I really appreciate your honesty and, you know, I wish you luck on your path. I think it's fantastic that you know what you want because so few people do. And, you know, he, he didn't do very well in the class and he dropped out of college as far as I know and, and hopefully gone on to a career as an electrician or whatever it was he wanted to do. I can't exactly know. But I was just impressed with his his self-knowledge yeah self-awareness yeah that's good that's good but thanks matthias for joining me today it was so good to have you on as a guest thanks for listening we're glad you were able to tune into this podcast once again, this is The New Chemist, where we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as the other sciences, careers, community, research, and COVID-19. Thanks again for listening. Note, the views on this podcast represent those of my guests and I.